Good afternoon, welcome to our live chat. Today we are going to talk about forest fires, floods, what happened in the summer of 2021. My name is Gülçin Karadeniz and I'm from the communications department mm -hmm. at the European Environment Agency and I have the pleasure of being joined by two colleagues, Hans Martin Füssel and Brian McSherry. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just say a few words about what you do at the agency, Hans Martin. Yeah. I mean, uh, together with many colleagues from all over Europe, I'm working uh, to ensure that policymakers in Europe, at the European national and the national level, have easy access to information about climate change in Europe and how it impacts nature and people. Brian, what about yeah, Thanks, Gretchen. So, um, I work with a bunch of colleagues as well who we collect and analyze and interpret information about biodiversity mm -hmm. in Europe. Um, we work with all the different countries across Europe, 38 mm -hmm. countries. And we do a lot of work in trying to understand and interpret what's happening, but also to inform policymakers as mm -hmm. to how we're progressing in different targets, where are the challenges, where are the issues, and then understanding, as we're talking about now, why these things are happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was it was a quite interesting summer, or was it usual? But f if you have yeah. questions about this uh, topic, which I believe is a quite uh, interesting yeah. topic, please um, insert them in the comment section, and uh, our colleagues will. Mm -hmm. Uh, compile them and we will be asking your questions to Brian and Hans Martin. So what happened this summer? Was it usual? Um, it, it was indeed a summer of extremes, of weather extremes and, and so many records were broken in, in Europe uh, but also globally. I mean many countries have experienced the hottest temperature ever both in northern Europe and in southern Europe and actually in Sicily, in Italy, 49 degrees were measured. That's, that's the hottest temperature ever measured in Europe. Um, and also at the global level, um, I mean, the July was the warmest month ever uh, um, on the Earth. This year was, uh, this summer was the warmest summer in uh, Europe. And even on the top of the Greenland ice sheet, we had rain for the first time. That was never experienced before. But we also had flooding incidents as well mm. at the same time, yeah. the same summer, with actually I mean, casualties. It was, there, yeah. it was a summer of extremes, as Hans yeah. Martin said. I mean, I think we had like the warmest, mm. the wettest, the windiest, the coldest. And I think something we're seeing is that this is a pattern. You would love to say it's not normal, but mm. I think over the last decade, 20 mm. years, you can see that every, mm. every year you're getting the most mm. extreme. Yeah, the extreme um, becomes yeah. kind mm. of normal. Yes. Yeah, yeah indeed. Yeah. Mm. And what we've seen actually was at least from what I could see mm. in the news, a lot of forest fires, areas yeah. burned, flooded, damaged, mm. and uh, how does nature get impacted by mm. these climate impacts? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think there is some immediate impacts and then there's some of the, maybe the drivers, why these mm. things are so extreme. I mean, the immediate one is, say, after a very big flood, we saw some really catastrophic examples in mm. Germany, but across Europe, you get landslides, you get lots of sediment being put into the rivers, into the lakes and that you know kills fish populations, mm -hmm. kills different shellfish living in there, mm -hmm. and that's got a knock-on effect to different areas, different mm -hmm. types of um, species as you go down. But another thing is to flip it around and say, well, why were mm -hmm. some of these events so extreme? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of it is because a lot of our landscape is it's at a kind of an ecologically tipping point. It's you know just a little bit pushes it beyond what we're doing. So mm -hmm. we did some work. I think about two years ago now on floodplains, mm. which cover about seven percent of Europe, and we found that seventy to ninety percent of them were in a poor condition. Mm. You might say, well, well, what does that mean? Yeah, poor condition. <laughs> yes, it, well, it means that they're they're not able to fulfil their ecological requirements. It, it's probably the technical mm -hmm. language, but it means that they're not able to absorb uh, water as well as mm -hmm. they could because they are sponges. They're a tool, you know, a natural tool, a solution for flooding, but they can't absorb it as much because they're damaged. Mm -hmm. Their can't absorb carbon to cool things mm -hmm. down, and they're just, you know, they're s not performing mm -hmm. to what they could. So actually what we are facing is some sort of a weakness on the nature side to mm -hmm. mitigate some of these things. But on the other side, I mean, climate projections, what do they tell us? The, the challenge is growing, right? It's getting the challenge better. is growing. I mean, climate change adds at the threat multiplier uh, in, in many different areas for ecosystems that are already stressed, uh, for, for vulnerable populations that are already... Uh, not so well adapted to the current climate, who might have difficulty heating or, or cooling their buildings, for example. And the projections are, are clear that climate change will continue, it will continue um, faster. But how fast and how much, of course, that depends on, on whether we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions globally. 
as all nations promised in Paris in 2015. Mm -hmm. So we and have a choice. There are different scenarios also that yes, you're looking at. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we could just expand a little bit on this kind of, you, mm. you talked about people being affected. Mm. We are talking about heat waves or yeah. cold snaps and mm. uh, you know some people being more vulnerable. Mm. What do we, uh, what, what can we say for our viewers who have just mm -hmm. joined us? What type of uh, impacts can we expect? So more floods, more uh, heat waves? De definitely more heat waves. I mean that, that is the most uh, clear sign of weather extremes and they will continue. Sea level is rising so that means uh, coastal floods. Luckily most coasts in Europe are well protected currently. We didn't have disastrous coastal floods for the last 50 years. Um, also more extreme rain and in Copenhagen or more recently in, in Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands we, we could experience uh, the catastrophic um, effects of that. And this is also uh, yeah, increasing in most parts of Europe, so we will definitely need to adapt to this in some way to these torrential rainfalls. Yeah. I mean, you did briefly mention about mm. the, the soil's capacity yeah. to absorb and so on. I have another question about, which is a word that is quite often linked to climate change mm. uh, or biodiversity, invasive alien species. So what can you say about that. Is yeah. this a threat? It, it, it is a threat. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a list of, um, there's a lot of known invasive mm -hmm. alien species and they're, they're collecting them. There's a, there's a regulation from the European Commission to do this and the agency collects information on those. But of course, then there's other ones that are a bit unknown. So we know this is a threat. Mm -hmm. We know we know not a lot of routes to how they get into Europe, into mm -hmm. our waters, into our rivers, onto our, our land. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them have brought in for cosmetic purposes. They look nice or they're attractive. Mm -hmm. But it, what it does mean, aside from, you know, maybe on a cycle or a cycle, depending mm -hmm. on perspective, it does push things that are already stressed, as Hans Martin mm -hmm. said about this, mm -hmm. in a stressed environment. It pushes things a bit mm -hmm. more and a bit more and a bit more. And, um, you know, as I said, we're at this kind of tipping point. And, it's already under stress, out of equilibrium, and these invasive alien species, they push things. But it also means that some of them, they're not adapted for the mm. European conditions. We see some tree species are planted for mm. either commercial purposes or for aesthetic purposes, mm. and they're not suited to the landscapes that they exist in. They either mm. burn too quickly, they bur burn with mm. too much of the intensity, mm. um, they cause the ground to be more acidic, which causes other problems. Mm. We had a case in Ireland where in a lot of coniferous woodland being planted mm -hmm. on bogs and actually had a negative carbon effect. Mm -hmm. It took so it instead of yeah, capturing instead of carbon, carbon it actually there. released more. Mm -hmm. And then it led to damage to the mm -hmm. wetlands, which led to after a cloud burst, landslides, pollution. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do. It's mm -hmm. it's a quite fragile equilibrium mm -hmm. as far as I understand. And some of mm -hmm. the things that you mentioned might be impacted by these changes in precipitation and temperatures. Yeah. I mean, can, can nature cope with this kind of uh, change in climate? Well, nature in general, yes, but not necessarily the kind of nature that we are expected to have around us and that we appreciate. Um, I mean, some of the uh, species that you call invasive species, Brian, are, are also uh, problematic for our health we see infectious diseases increasing. We now have West Nile virus, West Nile fever in, in various parts of Europe, it's expanding. We have other... It's because the, the, the vector, the, the mosquito, I believe, yeah. that's carrying it, yeah. can I actually mean come all the way up to where yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's called yeah. West Nile virus, uh, not <laughs> West Nile right. virus, but we have it in, in Europe in, in increasing yeah. parts. We see it, the ticks are expanding uh, further in altitudes. We see that a nice warm summer in the Baltic Sea is, is originally nice, you can swim, um, but at some point there's the risk of zebra infection, of, of uh, algae, algal blooms. So um, nature can adapt, but we may not always like the way nature okay. adapts. Yeah. But maybe as you were mentioning, some forest, like tree mm. species might have because I guess some mm. things are easier to move than for yeah. species and stuff. Yeah, I mean, what, what happens with climate change is species in the south tend to move north and mm. upwards. 
but that obviously pushes things out there's a competition mm-hmm. going in there mm-hmm. um, as Hans Martin said yeah nature will adapt but it's will we adapt to that I mean, we've seen cases of eutrophication so mm-hmm. like blooms everywhere mm-hmm. and the negative impacts mm-hmm. they have on biodiversity you know, human health mm-hmm. um, but yeah the, the landscape is it's moving but at the same time we've modified our landscape in mm-hmm. Europe to such a large extent mm-hmm. that kind of a more mm-hmm. natural movement of species is very difficult because we put mm-hmm. lots of blockers on them We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll come yeah. to the problems mm-hmm. and the solutions, how do we link? Mm-hmm. Uh, in the meantime, we actually have a first question okay. on Facebook from Alifteria, and uh, she's asking which European species are already affected by climate change or more vulnerable at mm-hmm. this stage? Mm-hmm. I, mean, I think I could start off with that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we know we collect information on mm-hmm. um, what we call our protected species, about 2,500 mm-hmm. species mm-hmm. that we collect information on every six years with all the countries mm-hmm. in Europe. And we do know that for um, a large number of those, climate change is one of the main drivers of pressure of why they're declining. Uh, we can probably go back and find out the, the list where it's the highest ranking of them, but we do collect this information and we know it is a significant driver for a large number of species to mm-hmm. stress them. And in some cases, it's mm-hmm. more of a, an impact than in other area cases. Mm-hmm. And it's often localized in certain regions as well, because it's mm-hmm. linked to increased soil temperature, increased groundwater, mm-hmm. ground temperature, lack of water, more extreme events, and it just, you know, Hans Martin said that word stress earlier on. We get stressed, mm-hmm. species get stressed. Of course. Mm-hmm. How can we handle it? How can they handle it? Yeah, because I think mm-hmm. some of the, the work that you do, you look at mm-hmm. average temperature increases or changes in precipitation, but, you know, some areas are above the average, and of some course, areas yeah. also get this massive precipitation, and so mm. on. So the average doesn't tell the full story. No, I mean the the, the average is uh, where you start, but then of course the impacts usually occur, uh, yeah, uh, when when extremes are happening, and that's also where where ecosystems are are impacted. I mean, w- we see that the composition of birds are are changing, that the warm loving birds are increasing in areas, and and the cold lovings are declining across Europe. We, we see that uh, fish are no longer uh, to be found where they used uh, to be. I mean, of course, climate change is not the only driver, but basically the, the cod fishing has, has broken down in the Baltic Sea, and it's partly overfishing, but it's also climate change um, and increasing temperature. And we see it even to the smallest uh, animals, like insects, that yeah. uh, their abundance is changing. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I mean, there's mm. a few iconic examples to really highlight what this looks like. I mean, mm. the ice is a really good example. We can see in northern Europe and, mm. you know, Greenland and parts of Iceland and even parts mm. of Russia, the, the, the water temperature in summer is a lot warmer than it has mm. been, so the sea ice is gone. Mm. And that causes huge stress then for all of the walruses, all the seals and the polar bears that feed mm. upon them. Mm. So you're getting these uh, dis- very disturbing mm. scenes of... Mm is crowding onto beaches and climbing mm. up cliffs mm. and falling off them and dying um, because there's no sea ice for them. And yeah. then the same with um, mm. a wide variety of different species. They're where they would normally be doesn't exist mm. anymore. So mm. they've got to go somewhere else and that causes problems with the system as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Before we started talking a little mm. bit about uh, you know possible solutions and things, but I, I want to talk a little bit about forests, if mm-hmm. I may say. Uh, because I think the summer of 2021 was really mm. struck by, at least in the news that I was following, mm. either by floods or massive yeah. flames yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. that were spreading. Why? Why are forests important and maybe yeah. why forest fires are happening? Yeah, you're right. This has been, I think, a, a season of media dominated by forest fires across the world. Mm. I mean, yeah, forests are obviously important because they, you know, they're a massive carbon storage, so they, they suck in carbon, they give us clean air, they filter the air we're in, they bind the soil that we're on, so they keep mm-hmm. it safe. They're obviously very important then for biodiversity, you know, birds, animals. There's this interaction of species mm-hmm. and forests are a really important part of that. Um, we do see as well that in, in Europe the composition of forests mm-hmm. is changing in different places. Some of it is natural, uh, but a lot of it is mm-hmm. plantation and planted mm-hmm. forests. And what we're seeing in some of the areas that have been most affected by fires, not exclusively, mm. that the fires are affecting species where there's maybe monoculture, only one species, mm. maybe only two species. So it's the same type mm. of same tree. Yeah. And then it's been affected really badly. And then we've got a history of um, 
landing abandoned so people aren't working the land, aren't mm. harvesting some of the small wood. Um, and it just means that, again, the system is out of kilter. And when it happens, it just takes them board. And we're seeing with the forest fires now is that they are a natural phenomenon. It happens. A lot of species are dependent on forest fires for their seeds. We see the joint sequoias in, in California are dependent upon this. But what's happening now is that the flames are getting so intense mm. and the heat is getting so intense that even these species that have adapted mm. to having forest fires for their, mm. their survival can't cope with it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you're saying that forest fires are natural, mm. but warmer temperatures or you know less water helps. So what what happens in forest with climate yeah. change? I mean, in, in some forest ecosystems, forest fires are a natural, a regular phenomenon. In others, they are um, an exception. And of course, forest fires, you always have to look at, at different aspects. Uh, clearly, what is the composition of the forest? Uh, then what is the climate? I mean, a um, hot, dry summer, in particular combined with dry soils, helps that when a fire is started that it spreads very quickly. And then of course human behavior. How, how is the forest managed? Does fuel uh, accumulate? In Europe, most of the uh, forest fires are actually ignited by humans, either accidentally through a cigarette butt or also on purpose. Um, for whatever reason, so the human behavior is always an important component in this. But yeah, with the uh, a certain climate condition, a small fire can easily spread in, into a disastrous one, even in ecosystems that are not used to it. And I should have added, actually, Hans Martin says and that reminded me, forests as well. They they offer shade, so it cools the temperature mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. um, but also they they retain moisture in the soil in mm -hmm. the soil. So that when an event happens. Mm -hmm. It isn't going to be as dramatic if mm. it's in a more natural balanced mm. system, but uh, as Hans mm. Martin said, when it's out of sync, it's drier, mm. it's more, there's less so shade. The yeah. When the soil is drier, then the forest fire is more likely yes. and yeah. also more extreme. Yeah. Yeah. And in, indeed, I mean, the last couple of years, five to eight years, we had uh, unprecedented droughts in large parts of Europe, so the soils are dry in large parts. I mean, even mm -hmm. in, in Denmark and Sweden, we had droughts and uh, also farmers, they couldn't even feed their animals any longer yeah. because the, the, the grass was drying. So it's not just the, the actual effect of uh, one season, um, it, it can accumulate in, in particular in the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. also because sea level, the, the sea temperature is changing mm -hmm. as well, it, it affects the, the weather patterns as well. You can mm -hmm. see that I think in the Mediterranean now it's several degrees warmer than average, which mm -hmm. is going to mean that the, the rains that would normally happen later on in the year are going to be changed and more intense. Mm -hmm. And that's you're going to say, oh, more water, not a problem. But it's just the the intensity of the events, and then how they're not very frequent causes that problem. So mm -hmm. as Hans Martin said, the average is your starting point, but then you look mm -hmm. at where it fluctuates. You yeah. start seeing those big problems happening. Mm -hmm. So the, the the challenge ahead is quite massive. But maybe we could talk mm -hmm. a little bit about solutions now. Yeah. But for our live viewers, so if you have any questions, please mm -hmm. do share them in the comments mm -hmm. section. Give uh, some minutes, and we can ask them to our. Uh, to experts. So imagine a forest area that's burned or a flooded mm. area uh, is damaged. Mm. What happens? We talk about restoration. What is restoration? Or we'll talk about climate resilience. So maybe mm. we start with restoration. Mm. Mm. What can be done and what is restoration? Yeah, there's a lot that can be done. So restoration is a concept of, as the name says, restoring a system back into what it would normally be. And it's a concept that's very important in Europe. The EU's biodiversity strategy, which was launched last year, has restoration as one of its main components of it. And if you break that down into the language that we use in biodiversity, we talk mm. about active restoration, which is where you, you have management practices, you're doing something, you're, you know, you're planting something, you're changing mm. one land use to another land use, which is more natural, or you have more passive mm. restoration, which is effectively you let nature go back and do what it's going mm. to do. Um, you know, a lot of times the, with forest fires, you have the seeds in the ground, so it can mm. come back. And in some cases, you're doing a combination of active and passive. You're, mm. you're removing those negative stressors, and you might be doing some management activities to promote certain types mm. of things. Mm. So there are there are solutions. It's not all doom and gloom. I mean, nature is very versatile. It's very adaptable. It can help us. Um, we just have to give it the space to do what it needs to do and remove mm. those negative um, aspects that are happening that are putting it under more pressure. Mm.
So how would we go about preparing this kind of, I would say, damaged or you know, mm. below optimal, what, what, what did you call it, poor condition yeah. area for the kind of climate that we are facing in the future? Yeah, M maybe just to um, reflect on what you said. I mean, you said nature is very adaptable and sometimes under the right condition, uh, a more resilient uh, ecosystem or forest will, will appear. Uh, that's not quite uh, the case if we talk about, let's say, a flood that, that's destroying a town. I mean, here uh, we use the concept of building back better because, of course, it's humans making the decision. And can, can I just ask, yeah? is it because we've built some of our cities in floodplains that that area is flooded? Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is definitely uh, an important factor, but we re really need to look at, at a specific case. In some cases, it might be sufficient to improve the resilience of individual buildings. You can do something, I mean, where you locate... Uh, how, how the doors are, are built, where you uh, locate um, electrical equipment or your heating system or something. Sometimes you need to upgrade a bit more, have flood barriers uh, along rivers. Um, they can even be mobile flood barriers. Um, but then there are cases where you really need to ask yourself, would you rebuild in the same place, in the same flood plain uh, that you have uh, just experienced a major flood? So it's it's really important to look at the specific circumstances and to have a cooperation between the national level, the regional level, the municipal level and, and the individual citizens affected. Mm -hmm. I think that cooperation is actually very important because if mm -hmm. you think of a river, they invariably run across mm -hmm. different regions within the country or across yeah. different countries as well. So what you can happen is that you're moving the problem from A to B. Mm -hmm. And I think it's you know that it's a combination of what Hans Martin was saying. There's a lot of things we can do structurally, engineering-wise, mm -hmm. to do things. But um, there's also a lot of work happening on what they call nature-based solutions, where you're mm -hmm. looking at the land upstream, yeah. downstream, and you're, mm -hmm. you're recreating or restoring floodplains. Mm -hmm. So you're basically, they're acting as a sponge. Mm -hmm. You've got wetlands, like peatlands. Mm -hmm. Instead of damaging them, you're leaving them, mm -hmm. and they absorb mm -hmm. the water. And what you're doing in those cases, you're not stopping flooding happening. Mm -hmm. you just, you're minimizing it, mm -hmm. and you're allowing the authorities have time to move people out mm -hmm. or evacuate or to do you know slight yeah. activities yeah. to mitigate against something. Mm -hmm. So it's about buying time for that. And we see a lot of examples across Europe where this is happening, or they're yeah. planting forestry upstream so they capture the water coming in. And you're mm -hmm. again the, the forest will retain the moisture in the soil. Mm -hmm. They'll bind the soil so you're not getting lots of debris mm -hmm. falling down. And it's about just you know having enough time so you can save lives downstream and mm -hmm. mitigate against damage as well. Mm -hmm. But does that also, you know, help keep the water in the soil? So this was something that we had uh, talked mm -hmm. about as well. And uh, is that the kind of nature-based solution instead of building grey infrastructure, water mm -hmm. canals and things? So you just allow the water to seep in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you have sorry, there. You, you have this with mm -hmm. planes. That's what they do. They're yeah. sponges, but hands working. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not always either or. I mean, uh, I, I guess in the past we've put too much emphasis on on structural on engineering solutions uh, to protect us from from extreme floods or so, and and they've worked to a certain degree. Um, but now we are also reevaluating re what we call nature-based solutions. Um, that means, uh, for instance, uh, designing a, a city also as a sponge to some degree, or planting more trees uh, to cool down an area. And, and there are many examples, and, and also at EA we've published reports, we've looked at, at good examples from across Europe, um, which are often either cheaper or provide additional benefits. I mean, some of the improvements we see in the city of Copenhagen may have been driven to cope with climate extremes, but they also improved the neighborhood. They, they created green places where people can come together and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of having a more integrated view rather than a narrow one where whatever a wall is only there to keep the water off. Yeah. We've got one more question mm -hmm. uh, from Marius on Facebook. So we are going back to the species uh, <laughs> and climate change. Do we see European species migrating to other regions because of climate change? I guess we do, 
Mm. We do. We see see what we call typical European species migrating further north mm. I- into Europe, and you'll probably say maybe including parts of Russia into the Europe mm. definition. Um, you would see some bird species as well as Hans Martin mm. at the start, the warm ones. They, they'll move. Their, their patterns will mm. change. How the birds will migrate will mm. change. Um, the common species would see they're moving. Um, we don't see them moving like to Africa or anywhere else because mm. the the tendency is mm. is up. Where it's cooler and north mm. where it's cooler um, but it does mean there's going to be pressure in certain areas and mm. you know if you're on a mountain you're moving up there only comes a certain mm. point where you can't mm. move any further or you know there could be a barrier to move further north there might be a really big river or man-made obstacles mm. to stop that happening but yeah we see them there are moving in species that would normally not mm. occur in parts of europe are occurring and observations mm. are seen and it's very interesting you see a species, you know, well, but then you realise that should not be where I'm seeing it. It's mm. from several hundred kilometres away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see species migrating, for example, palms from Italy we, uh, that made it across the, the Alps and can now be found in, in certain places in Switzerland. The cods that I mentioned earlier that we're missing in the Baltic Sea suddenly show up around Greenland in, in masses where they've never been. Yeah. So there's a lot of movement. Um, and yeah, generally northwards. I mean, the, the most, let, let's say, the, the most problematic areas are indeed there where, where there are barriers to adaptation. It could be a sea, it could be a wide river, it could be mountains. So imagine you're a cold loving species that, uh, in, which only lives in top mountain areas and it just gets too warm. I mean, there is no place for this species to migrate. So, mm-hmm. and, and these are often biodiversity hotspots. Mm. I think one of the issues that I've seen in our assessments was actually mm-hmm. the, the building infrastructure like roads. If you don't have the corridors yeah. mm-hmm. to allow the safe yeah. uh, you know, yeah. movement of these mm-hmm. species. We've got a few minutes left, but okay. Uh, okay. We've got another question uh, from Nora, uh, who is asking, what would be the biggest worry at the moment? So it's, it's kind of a nice wrap up. I want to ask you about where you know our viewers or anybody can find some more information, but maybe something that you you would both want to mention what's the biggest worry in terms of nature ecosystems and what's the biggest worry in terms of climate change mm-hmm. maybe we start with I, mean, I mean i think there, there are two they're, they're linked first of all i think climate and mm-hmm. nature are just mm-hmm. two sides of the same coin i mean, my worry is that we we know what we need to do we know what the problems are we know what the solutions are is that we don't act we don't do mm-hmm. that's my biggest worry is that Mm. We just don't do what we know we need to do. Who 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 doesn't mm. act? Is it the citizens or is it the authorities? I, I think it's a combination of everyone. It's just I mean the easy answer is society, but again that goes into the you know as as a citizen you have a choice with how you purchase, your companies you buy from, mm. uh, what their environmental mandates are. Mm. Um, also then the politicians we elect, you know let's mm. push them on the environmental, mm. climate change, mm. biodiversity aspects and put pressure on all the different actors in the world too. I mean a lot of companies are really keen to do their bit because it's important and it's good for business. But you know, you use your use your money widely wisely and elect people. And then act personally as well. You know, change how you behave, change how you eat, change how you travel, change how you do things. Mm. What about your biggest worry? Mm, I, I would say two things. On the scientific side, um, in terms of climate change, it's heat waves and really deadly heat waves um, that we cannot adapt um, to unless we really completely change how we live. It's droughts that can depopulate regions um, and destroy traditional uh, culture, and it's sea level rise in the long term. I mean, we're probably located around two meters above sea level here. That is the upper range of, of the latest IPCC, the highest IPCC scenario uh, for the end of the century. Um, but beyond that, if, if you look at, it, at the human side, uh, my, my biggest worry is that the science of climate change gets politicized. I mean, for solutions, that there are, there's a lot of room for political debate. How do we fairly distribute the burdens, the benefits, and so on? But the science should not be politicized. And, we're generally in a good position in Europe, but it's still a worry. Which brings mm-hmm. me actually to the point that I wanted to mention. So mm-hmm. where can our viewers uh, get reliable information on mm-hmm. the issues that we discussed? Maybe you mm-hmm. could just mention a few and share the links. 
Mm. We do receive another question we, mm -hmm. which we could take, but maybe mm. while you... I think maybe on that point about the reliable information, I mean, in the agency we have a, a wide variety of reports and online mm. platforms. I mm. mean, so I'll talk about the nature ones, but mm. we have a product called State of Nature, which gives you an overview mm. as mm. to what the condition of habitats and species are in Europe. It's really interesting mm. reading, and it's, it's written in a way as well as quite accessible. Mm. And then we have a lot of background information about that if you want to dive in detail and work mm. out exactly mm. what habitats and what species and where. Where if you're more knowledgeable, and want to increase your knowledge base, mm -hmm. and we have a, so we have a lot of platforms there um, to give that information. Um, so go into the agency website, State of Nature, biodiversity information system mm -hmm. for Europe, or forest information system for Europe, or water information systems mm -hmm. for Europe are good starting points. Mm -hmm. On climate change adaptation. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, I also have to uh, mention some products of our agency first. Um, we have a number of, of reports which you can find on the website if you look on the climate change adaptation. Also last year we published a, a so-called story map on climate change impacts in Europe which was a, a step in becoming more interactive where you can actually explore how certain uh, things like extreme rain has, has changed in your area. Um, if you're interested in data, I can recommend the European Climate Data Explorer. There we uh, collaborate together with the Copernicus Climate Change Service to bring high quality climate data to the end user and also the Climate Adapt platform in general is kind of the, the first stop shop for adaptation information in Europe. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of information, mm -hmm. it's just a question of finding it. And then well, just to say also, of course, beyond the agency, climate change, the intergovernmental panel on climate change is, is a key source. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's a bit technical, but if you're interested, this is is really the, the agreed base mm -hmm. for, for cl climate knowledge globally. Which also defines the different scenarios that are. Yeah. We'll take one uh, last um, question from Anvesha. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because we talked a little bit about uh, that, but mm -hmm. is the EU already taking into account the possibilities of new pathogens due to climate change and resulting diseases from such pathogens? Mm -hmm. If so, are these getting reflected at the policy level? You, you've been looking into that kind of uh, new diseases that might come as a... Yeah, in this context I might also mention the European Climate and Health Observatory that I helped developing, where you can find uh, some of this information. So yes, new diseases are uh, spreading in, in Europe, um, schistosomiasis, um, West Nile fever, uh, tick-borne diseases are, are um, in increasing a, a few others, dengue fever. So we're looking at this and I think that the last one and a half years of the p pandemic have helped to provide policy focus on, on the importance of health also at the European level. I mean health policy is with the member states but there's an, I, I think a general recognition that, that Europe can help and, and we see um, for instance, our partner agency, the European Centre for Disease Prevention Control, and in Stockholm, it is also increasing its work in this area. Mm. I guess mm. COVID was an example of yeah. you know, strengthening yeah. this kind of cooperation yes. between health and mm. uh, member states. Just add as well that the EU's biodiversity strategy does have pathogens in there as mm. one of the, the drivers for restoring and protecting nature is to mm. mitigate against this. We see with COVID-19, I mean, the debates where it come from, but it's quite clear an agriculture environment uh, ecosystem was mm -hmm. the driver for this happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true, that was something that came yeah. up. So before we thank our viewers, 20 seconds, 30 <laughs> seconds, any last comments, anything that you think that you should have mentioned but have not had the <laughs> time? I, I think maybe one or two points. I think um, we shouldn't underestimate the connections between the different mm -hmm. elements, biodiversity mm -hmm. climate change, it's really one area mm -hmm. and we focus on different things because the, the elements and the connection between them are so implicit. I think that we, we do know enough that we can do things, mm -hmm. we can change, we know what we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, the policy is there, we need to get people to drive it and do it and support mm -hmm. the efforts that are happening across, your, across every country mm -hmm. in Europe to do this. What about your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I would say never give up hope. There's, uh, with hope, um, fantastic changes can happen, and we've also seen it at a political level here in Europe in the, in the last few years, and allow for complexity. I mean, 
the problem is not black and white, the solutions are not black and white. So yeah, to have a, a flexible mindset, to learn from each other, to see the trade-offs, to, to see surprises and uh, rather than get hung up on, on, on something small that may be difficult to understand. Yeah. So the challenge is big, it's complex, but there are mm. solutions and there is information mm. and there's hope. So on that note, I would like to thank my mm. two guests, Brian and Hans Martin, for joining mm. me and uh, my viewers and the team behind the scenes that has, uh, our viewers, the team behind the scene that has uh, enabled this uh, live chat. So thank you very much for following. <laughs>